We are live. Welcome to Willow 2022 Review and Thoughts. And yes, this is either a review of a miniseries or the season one of a show. Right now, it looks like there's not going to be more than one season. So yeah, if there is, I guess maybe I'll make another video after the release of future seasons. I'm going to start by telling you, this was a show I really loved. This video will have some jokes, and I will definitely get into uh, some serious topics. And the... let's see... Right, so uh, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. This video is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger, until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And, uh, yeah. Um, I am... Right. I will be spoiling the movie, since it's, dif it's very difficult to talk about this show without spoiling the movie at all. If you want my spoiler-filled thoughts on episodes, the link to them will be in the description box. So... I have watched the first seven episodes twice each, and the eighth and final episode once. And I just got done recording my thoughts on videos, so it's still very fresh in my memory. So, uh, the plot. I suppose... yes, so, following the movie, unsurprisingly, Matt Mardigan and Sorsha got married and procreated, and they had son, Eric, and daughter, Kit. And, yeah, um, this is now, yeah, I guess it's, based on their ages, it's more like 20 years later, rather than, you know, in reality, it's, well, actually, yeah, yeah, hold on, I guess it has been 35, 34 to 35 years, since the movie. I think it's closer to 20 or 25 years that have passed in-universe, but yeah. And one day, Prince Eric is kidnapped, and his sister Kit and various others quest to free him. I will talk about the others as well. And yeah, um, th at the start of the first episode, Sorsha retells the first film and fills us in on what has happened after that and before now. Now, um, you are definitely going to get more out of this movie if you watched the 1988 movie, uh, Willow. Also called Willow. And, yeah, it, it builds on things in that. And, uh, yeah, I would say you can easily binge this show. You know, if you're watching this video and you haven't watched a single episode yet... You chose not to watch them when they first premiered. And yeah, I, I could see uh, binging all, ep eight, all eight episodes. But if you choose to only watch one at a time, you know, um, yeah, one was released every week for eight weeks in a row. And you can just, you know, yeah, if you watch them one at a time and wait between, you know, you might... Try to think of, wait, what's going to happen next? And does this really do this? And, you know. So, yeah. I, I would say, regardless of which of those are to your preference, the, the show is going to work for that viewing style. Now, uh, let's see. So, yeah. It tries to capture the mood other than the comedic relief and... Actually, yeah, never mind. The trailer appears to, but the tone is not always the same in this as... And I will get into that shortly. So, um, let's see. Yeah, and certainly some of the co comedic relief from the movie, they really toned down substantially. Uh, you know, a lot of people who watch this as an adult or read watch it as an adult said they didn't like the comedy that much. Maybe this is in response to that. And, uh, right, so I've seen some people say that this show, based on press releases and such, is woke, since there are several minorities in the main cast. 
I guess they missed the point that the original movie was making that sometimes it's the people that people yeah it's the people that others don't think of as heroes you know a dwarf who's also a farmer who save you know and and a, a thief who used to have no honor who saved the world you know with almost no exception every important decision in the movie is made or heavily influenced by a woman or even an infant girl. It is a movie where good people risk lives to protect those that are not in the in-group. Even Willow's kids are brave. Minor antagonists don't care about the safety of those not in the in-group, and evil ones seek to destroy those who are different or enslave them. If the movie was made today, it wouldn't be a baby, but a member of the LGBTQ community, maybe a, an ethnic minority, possibly both. The film was about as woke as it could be for the time. Uh, you know, the Star Wars sequel trilogy ran into the same thing, which, again, had the same point as the original trilogy. And, and the Willow movie and the Willow show. Diversity is a strength, not a weakness. It's the bad guys who are all the same. Also, and I say this with no judgment, Warwick Davis is 40, 52 years old. It is unrealistic to expect him to do the kind of action scenes that the main cast, who's basically all made up of young people, can do. So, uh, starting with the writing. This was... So, so yeah. Uh, the, yeah, this was developed by Jonathan Kazdan, the son of uh, Lawrence Kazdan, who helped... You know, yeah, he, he made a huge... Uh, contribution to the original Star Wars trilogy. Um, and Jonathan Kasdan also wrote three of the eight episodes. Let's see. And, yeah, other than that, there is a writer's room. I gotta say, I don't know any of these people. Um, but, yeah, um, the, um, the writing has a lot of really important messages for the presumed young audience. Um, you know, one of the... Uh, I guess I don't want to say exactly who, but someone who... Yeah. Uh, um, someone who is either a prince or a princess says to another prince or princess, we can change the ways of our parents, which, you know, in, in present day translates to not parents, you know, not kings or queens, thankfully, in a lot of, West, you know, sadly still some countries. Anyway, former leaders, you know, and um, yeah, we see that some powerful men believe they're completely safe, but the smarter ones consider that might not be the case, just like in real life. It has a lot of complex ideas about human beings and our interpersonal relationships, and they're handled with a lot of emotional intelligence. Um, plot twists are handled pretty well. Um, there's not so many that it's just, like, non-stop and you can barely keep up. Um, and they... Yeah, uh, that's as much as I'm going to say without spoiling. So, the pilot is quite good. Um, basically, you you get a sense of the world of the the ensemble cast... You know, by the end of the pilot, you you know a lot of the most important characters that are in all eight episodes. And I, I would say, you know, if, if the pilot really doesn't capture you, the show might not be for you. Although some people have criticized that Willow is not in a huge chunk of the pilot. They, they thought he was in too little of the pilot. After the pilot, he is in, you know, much more of the show. You know, it's it's basically build up. It's building up to his inclusion. The finale is really good. Um, ultimately, it does seem like they thought there would be a season two, but it is not one of those just, you know. I suppose an argument could be made that maybe it counts as a cliffhanger, but it does resolve the major conflicts set up. Um, there's, yeah, and and it's you know it's a very fun, exciting episode. You know, it's it's more 
exciting than, you know, some of the MCU Disney Plus shows have not managed to be, you know, the, the finale won't have that much action. Um, I can't, I'm not really going to give away which ones, but just, you know, it's not a huge problem, but it does occasionally happen for those, and it didn't hear um, let's see, this this also does a better job with, with villains than the a lot of the MCU uh, Disney Plus shows. And basically all of the Star Wars live-action Disney Plus shows. Um, yeah, you know, you get a sense of who the villains are. You know what they're trying to do from, from fairly early on. You know, it's not this, ooh, who's going to be the villain? Who really, you know, maybe it's in part because, you know, with the comic... The MCU ones, they have a lot of comic books, so, you know, let's sprinkle in some some red herring villains. You know, maybe the villain will be this important person from the comics. And then after a while, it's not, oh, I guess they really weren't. They were just kind of... I'm sounding really down on the, the MCU Disney Plus shows. I do love them. Uh, right. I think this does a good job of following up the movie. Um, and I acknowledge that some people don't, um, but yeah, you know, the, the, some of the themes and ideas are, you know, because this is, this has eight episodes, it has more time to dive more into them and let's see the, yeah, so this was directed by Philippa Lothorpe, Debs Patterson, Stephen Wolden, and... Jamie, Jamie Childs, all four of them directed two episodes each, adding up to all eight. I gotta say, um, I didn't really, I only, I actually kind of forgot that it was different people directing the different episodes. Um, yeah, they all do a really good job. They, they get, um, they hit the same style enough that it doesn't feel like it's just a bunch of different, you know, uh, so, like other shows on Disney+, Plus, like their Star Wars and MCU shows, at times it's funny, charming, it has action. Like most of them, it's also cool. But something that not all of them are, this is gross and even scary. Like, PG scary. Like, kids could watch, not okay for, like, small children. Like, I would say, I'm not sure I would let someone younger than seven watch. And maybe, yes, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe wait until they're just out of the the single digits in in age before you start showing to them or at the very least if something about it kind of scares them talk to them about it you know remind them that it's not real you know um yeah that that kind of thing but yeah it it is legitimately um it's not like r rated you know it it is something that children could watch and not be just completely, you know, horrified by, you know, yeah, yeah, um, I, wa last week I watched, uh, Barbarian, which is also on Disney+, Plus, uh, but that one is behind the, the age gate thing, you know, but, but yeah, that one should not be watched by children, that is definitely not something that children would be okay with watching, so, yeah. Now, out of fear that it wouldn't be taken seriously since they're adapted comic books, the MCU tones down the colors of the costumes and, you know, items and, and such. And in order to be consistent, they tone down most other colors as well. This one lets colors be full. When it's during the day and people are in a place denoted by the good, it's bright and colorful. Evil and nighttime is dark, sometimes pitch black. You know, it really, really uses the full range of color and... Yeah, as as someone who's been watching these, you know, yeah, the MCU ones do, you know, tone down. Uh, yeah, the Star Wars ones did kind of tone down. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose Star Wars, there's always been a certain grit to it. But anyway, um, let's see. Right, and unlike the live-action Disney Plus Star Wars shows... This isn't constantly referencing the movie. Frankly, some of those shows really go overboard with the references. So do the, the Star Wars movies, all five of them. This could easily have done the same. You know, I really appreciate that, that they didn't. It's much better this way. 
And yeah, I have some credit quotes. With a tone more akin to The Princess Bride, it manages to take the logic of its fantasy world seriously while depicting characters with very modern behaviors and conversations. Now, that's something that has bothered a lot of people. I think it is just necessary. Like, at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do in a fantasy setting that's going to be relevant to modern day, you know. Um, and it's, again, like the movie, you know, uh, Willow needs to be more confident. Uh, uh, Mad Mardigan needs to, to, you know, think more about other people, not only himself all the time. You know, these are things that, you know, uh, Sorsha refuses to go along with her mother because she realizes how evil she is. You know, these are things that, you know, young people can, can learn from watching the movie, but there's not that many of them in the movie and you know in part it's also because of the running time but this show has a lot of messages that young people can really benefit from a lot of a lot of examples to emulate um yeah you know you'll it's 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 well worth looking at how this show defines good and evil uh the kinds of things that the good people do um you know, not every, not all of it is perfect, but they're at least trying to, to do the right thing. And the evil ones are very self, yeah, s selfish and, and don't want, you know, don't, don't care about hurting those who are different. You know, these kinds of things, yeah, that just, that is extremely important. Now, uh, let's see. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so some people felt that the overall look and feel of the series makes it look like a network television show from the 90s. I mean, I suppose I'm not the best to, to judge that. I've watched a bunch of those, but I really don't watch a lot of current shows. If it's not on Disney+, Plus and related to, like, Star Wars or, or MCU, or in this case, Willow, which I did watch years and years ago, uh, long before you know, yeah, uh, I suppose it's, there's, there's some truth to, it, it doesn't quite have the, you know, certainly some of the Disney Plus, some, uh, some of the MCU shows on Disney Plus have been a lot more daring stylistically than, than this, uh, stuff like the, the WandaVision and Moon Knight, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's some truth to that. Um, yeah, some feel it's entertaining in bursts, but uneven overall. I respectfully disagree. Um, let's see. Expertly balancing accessibility for new viewers and continuing the story that 80s baby babies love with stunning cinematography, charming performances, and vibrant storytelling, this feels like Disney Plus at its best. Um, I should, yeah, actually thinking about, it, um... You don't have to have watched the movie, but it does make sense to, and, you know, I, I guess I can't speak for, I don't know if it's all over the world, but certainly here in, in Western Europe, the show and the movie are both on Disney+, Plus. so it's, you're not spending money, you're only spending time on, you know, and it's not like, it's not an insanely long movie, it's like two hours, just over two hours, you know. Um... But, but yeah, uh, ultimately you could watch this without watching the movie because you do get the, the, the things that you need to be told that are important for the show are also told on the show. So, yeah, uh, honestly, I could see a lot of, I don't know that I would watch, that I, that I would show the movie from 1988 to someone was like a teenager today, you know, I mean, they, I, I might show them, like, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, because that, you know, that's, that's easier for them to, to digest, and that is also, to be sure, excellent trilogy, uh, of movies. Let's see, the, the, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'd show Star Wars to a teenager, the, the original, well, the first two, not the, I suppose I'd let it be up to them if they wanted to watch Return of the Jedi. 
But yeah, uh, I don't know that the 1988 film, it just, yeah, Ron Howard, not as great at the bringing that kind of material to life as Lucas and and the, I, I can't believe I'm blanking on their names, but the, the other two directors of the original Star Wars trilogy. Um, so, so yeah, they might have been figuring on that. Let's see... Willow is ultimately a rare treat. The fantasy answers to Top Gun Maverick that gives fans everything they want and even more. I, I can't speak to that. I haven't watched any Top Gun. Um, I think the Julie Nolke video, talking, pretending that she watched Top Gun, was fun. Uh, let's see. We finally have a sequel that continues the Willow saga with the heart and soul the story deserves. Disney Plus's new series, Willow, is a raggedy, hilarious, and absolutely enchanting continuation of the Lucasfilm cult classic. Instead of wallowing in grimdark imagery or losing itself, tripping over unnecessary mystery boxes, Willow embraces the joy of its source material. Willow is a tour de force of fun and fantasy frivolity. And yeah, I absolutely agree. And that's also, like, if you, if you just remember watching the original movie and you're like, oh, it was so dark, watch it again. It's, for sure, there's some darkness. But a lot of it, it's, you know, every so often there'll be something very light. And I, I acknowledge, you know, some people feel that this doesn't um, balance the, the darkness and the, the joy as well. Uh, Roguish and Ribald, this fantasy never forgets, it's supposed to be fun. Unapologetically traditional fantasy with no pretensions of Game of Thrones style grimness or Lord of the Rings cultural depth, but it also has vivid characters, scary moments, and fun obstacles, and they carry it briskly along. In the end, it relies far less on nostalgia and more on expanding the world of the original film to encompass new complexity and new identities among all these daikinis, and that's a real treat. Let's see... Okay, so just briefly, um, yeah, uh, user review opened with, I hate conspiracy theories, which to me is a, is a great relief when I start reading a review. But then he includes a but, which makes you realize, you know, just don't, don't even start like that, because, okay, what he then says is, he or she, or they... Those who postulate that Disney is intent on deconstructing every cherished memory that a generation has of its youth and replacing it with some garbage seem to be increasingly on the mark. You just don't like what they're doing. That's fine, but it's ridiculous to claim, oh, you know, they just want to... Just... Yeah, there, you know, there's definitely some deconstruction going on in, in some of these. I'm not sure that I would necessarily say this deconstructs that much. Certainly the the... New Star Wars trilogy deconstructs the original trilogy, but they're not replacing it with garbage. They're trying to do something interesting there. I'm, I'm not sure that I would really say that this particularly deconstructs the, the Willow movie, in case that was something that you were either worried about or hoping for. So, uh, characters. Warwick Davis returns as Willow of Good, a Nelwyn dwarf sorcerer who leads a party to rescue Eric. Now, um, let's see. So, uh, yeah. Um, very early on, um, the, the, um, his magical prowess is called into question. I can imagine some conservatives will probably say that this, like, betrays the character. If you go back and watch the movie, like, you know, okay, he does the disappearing pig trick uh, twice. Other than that, you know, okay, there's the time he turns uh, Rizel into, you know, back into human from animal. But he really struggles through that. Like, that's, I think, over three attempts... And he keeps failing, you know, he, he keeps turning her into a different animal instead of turning her back to a human. So, so yeah, you know, it, it, it acknowledges that he's not a great sorcerer by the end of the movie. And whether or not he has become since then and why or why not is gone into. I don't really want to... 
Okay, yeah, uh, just briefly. Okay, so if you want to know, before watching the show, has Willow become just, you know, the, the greatest sorcerer of all time as, you know, he, he, you know, he wanted to become a great sorcerer. So if you don't want to know, mute until you see me little my index finger. In a word, no. Uh, he hasn't, but it does explain why. And personally, I, I thought his character was more compelling this way. But yeah, no more spoilers for the time being. Um, you know, and and yeah, I mean, this was a movie. You know, you might not remember, but this actually featured a lot of dwarves in the the, the show. The me, yeah. I swear, I got enough sleep last night. I don't want this is. In the movie, there are a lot of dwarves, and apparently it was like the biggest American production at the time, the, the uh, biggest amount of dwarves in an American production at the time. You know, yeah, uh, before the movie, dwarves were often overlooked. They didn't have enough people to look up to. Honestly, before the movie, what did most people even know about dwarves? Very little. And... Yeah, uh, Ellie Bamber. Yeah, uh, uh, he, he and and um, the actress playing Sorsha are the only two returning cast members. That um, I suppose I should. Uh, there is an explanation. There is an in-universe explanation for why Mad Mardigan is not. Um, obviously, the real answer is his his health. But they do also, you know, in in the actual, um, in the actual show, in the actual show, they do acknowledge why he isn't around. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, Ellie Bamber plays Dove, and she's a kitchen maid, but she's in love with Eric. And joins the quest to save him, even though he's a prince. And we find out very early on she is an she's a phenomenal cook. She that she uses the word phenomenal. And yeah, there's no shame in that being your strength as long as that's what you want. And um Yeah, uh, uh, she isn't skilled in the physical sense, but that doesn't mean she lacks courage. On the contrary. So she is on the quest because of a man, but it is to rescue him rather than a man rescuing a woman. And she does self-actualize on the quest. Um, yeah, so there's a thing here that's arguably a spoiler. So mutant, skip ahead and choose him below on my index finger if you don't want to hear a spoiler. Um, yeah, it's revealed... That Elora is, uh, yeah, Dove is actually Elora Dannon, and yeah, um, you know she then has all this, um, this huge responsibility on her shoulders, and the show kind of explores, you know, what's it like to to be this person that everyone thinks is gonna save the world. This is just. The single most important thing, you know, and then you find out that's supposed to be you, and it's, yeah. No more spoilers for the time, be un until the next time I raise an index finger. Uh, Ruby Cruz plays Princess Kit, and she's the one who decides the, the um, that they're, you know... Yeah, that they're going to go try save uh, Eric. Um, some people feel she's too harsh when talking to her subjects. I would point to the fact that she accepts other people's quips at her expense. She, you know, she's not, like, constantly asking some other people to treat her like she's better than them by birth. Uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, I, I understand why it bothers other people, but I do think that... Because of that, it is, you know, and honestly, most other people, like, when she, I, 
I didn't really get the sense watching this show that someone didn't say, you know, if they thought that she had a really bad idea, they told her to her face. They weren't like... I guess we gotta do it because she's the princess and she's gonna, you know, she's gonna put me in prison if I don't go along. No, 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 that they're always, you know, so so the fact that she also can be harsh, you know, she 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 gets as good as she gives and she has a somewhat androgynous appearance telling young women that that's okay, which it is. It's sad that we still have to say this, but... We do, because there's people freaking out over the idea of of women not looking super feminine all the time, or men not looking super masculine all the time. Um, okay, so by now it's been months, but yeah, a uh, bunch of conservatives freaked out when, what was his name, Harry Styles, I want to say, uh, when he, like... Ah, uh, let's see. I think he wore a dress in a photo shoot or something like that. Like, I don't even... Re I, I don't, you know... I don't care about fashion, so I don't really... You know, I, I think he did, he does incredible acting in Interstellar. But, uh, wow, I swear I slept last night. I don't know what is... Dunkirk. He did excellent acting in Dunkirk. Uh, I'd like to see him in more, but I feel like I heard that he's possibly quitting acting. If I... I thought that uh, uh, Don't Worry Darling looked fine, but then I heard a bunch of bad things about it, so I don't know. Um, if it goes to Disney+, Plus, I'll probably watch it at some point. Um, but, but yeah, that's why it's still necessary to have messages like this, you know, because conservatives, conservative pundits freak out when a man or woman really you know defies expectations when the, yeah Erin Kellyman plays Jade a knight in training and she is to be the first female knight on account they realize that she's as good as the men again again an important message for young women and she's also Kit's love interest and she joins in the quest because Kit's you know she she wants to protect Kit the relationship between Kit and Jade makes the series the first true franchise on Disney Plus to really center an LGBTQ story, according to Polygon. About time. Jonathan Kazdan was apparently very interested in centering it on this LGBTQ story. He was the one who also made sure that it was canon that Lando Calrissian was pansexual. And I personally think Donald Glover put it perfectly in an interview when he said... How can you not be pansexual in space? There are so many things to have sex with. We need more people like Jonathan Kasdan in the entertainment industry. I really hope that he continues to, to do these sorts of things. You know, he's already added so much to Star Wars and Willow. Yeah. Um, I know some people don't seem to like actress Erin Kellyman. I gotta say, every time I see her... Frequently, broadly smiling, freckled face. I know I'm about to see some really solid acting. Like, um, I guess, is it a spoiler? It's not a spoiler. Um, on, you know, in this, she is, like, charming, but also can be very, very serious. She takes her responsibilities very seriously. Um, and, you know, uh, likable, I guess. You know, just, yeah, you, you could uh, see yourself, like, um... You know, you'd want to be friends with her. Um, yeah, or potentially be with her, depending on what you're into. Um, on the Disney Plus MCU show, um, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, she is terrifying. Like, she, yeah, she has this bright young face, but the things she says and the way she says them, yeah. So, you know, she can do both of these extremes. She's not always this likable and, you know, and she does smile on that show. And sometimes it, it feels like a warm smile, but other times it's this very sinister, terrifying, like, holy crap, I would not want to cross her if, if just, yeah, if, if I met Erin Kellyman in real life, having barely watched any interviews, I would want to make sure which of these characters she's more like before I... Like, <laughs> holy crap, she was scary in that. Anyway, um, 
And Jade and Kit are very sweet together. I really love how unafraid the show is about their pairing. Just, yeah, love the diversity on display. Um, Ruby Cruz, I... For, uh, hold on. I will look up real quick. So, uh, did I get her name wrong? No, it says, yeah, it says it's right here. Anyway, um, let's see. Okay, so it does not... Um, hmm... Um, okay, I'm not going to, to, I just, I feel like, or I don't know, is she just Caucasian? A anyway, um, you know, but yeah, uh, Aaron Kellyman is, okay, so, so apparently, I don't know if I'm supposed to use that word, because certainly Tim Minchin doesn't, she is a redhead, let's go with that, um, and, yeah, uh, then you also have Tony Revolori and Amar Chata Patel. Uh, so, so yeah, um, you know, very, uh, um, yeah, more of a, you know, and, and, yeah, you know, yeah, if, if you're like, oh, there's so much diversity on the show, well, there are fewer, you know, there are more dwarves in the movie than there are, you know, non-whites in the show, so, at, at least major characters, for sure. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate the women on the show really have guts, and the women on the show are sometimes called out when they should be. Um, let's see. You know, sometimes by other women, and... You know, if they are called out, they, they, you know, they acknowledge I did something wrong and they change what they're doing. They express fear and other negative emotions. In general, it's a show where people express their emotions. You know, it, it has women showing fear, men acknowledging that they don't always feel, you know, they talk about expectations, for example, which, you know, used to be that if a guy talked about I don't know if I can live up to who, you know, who I'm apparently supposed to be, you know. Yeah, that that would apparently be, like, a mortal sin. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I really don't like the, the, the term Mary Sue because it is very frequently just used about women. It's, it's basically a way to try to get away with sexism and misogyny by dressing it up as film criticism it's really just but if you you know i i don't i'm not sure i currently know uh, a good uh, alternative so i i i tend to just describe them but what i'm getting at here is this show does not have mary sue characters and like the movie, the show is saying that a, even the least of us may contain greatness. We still need LGBTQ characters and relationships depicted in a positive light in media, not only because they are a group disproportionately targeted for hate crimes, including murder, but also because when that happens, conservative media personalities, I refuse to, refuse to refer to them as journalists, victim blame and... You know, relatively recently, we even saw them giddy that a recent shooter identified as non-binary as if that somehow makes it right to hate lgbtq people the fact that there are some in the minority of the minority who are hateful and violent just it's just it's it's beyond disgusting it's it's repulsive to the the way that conservatives will still conservative media personalities i don't know all you know i'm not going to speak for every single conservative individual, but conservative media personalities, they just, they love spewing and spreading hatred, and it's just beyond disgusting. Like, I, I know that I, I'm not American, and I didn't grow up in, like, the biggest city, so, you know, sometimes I might sound really, like, some, some people think I'm too optimistic. I say you have to, if, if you accept 
the the worst that p other people say, then it's not. Then you can't make things better. You you have to try to find a way to to make things better by you know it, yeah. Part of it is aspiring for you know to make the world a better place, and yeah you know this is a show that shares my optimism, and yeah I I'm really really glad to to see stuff like this. You know, I remember the 90s. I remember when, you know, it was just, uh, let's go edgy if we're going to make entertainment for young people. And, you know, oh, everything is hopeless. And, you know, the the world sucks and nothing will ever get any better. You know, yeah, it's kind of just... I don't think I liked it at the time, even even though I was, at times, definitely one of the one of the angrier more bitter teenagers but yeah it just we're not going to we're not going to be made happy by constantly focusing on the bad now uh yeah tony revolori plays prince graydon a young scholar member of the quest and you know at at the very start it seems like oh wow he just he's not very impressive but you you start to realize he's He's just a tad more quiet, uh, you know. He's he's uh, he you know he's shown to be yeah a scholar. You know he can read written and understand spoken languages that the others just cannot, and you know others listen to him when he explains. No, no, no. I heard what they said, and it translates into this. Or you know he'll find something written in an ancient language, and the others will will stand and listen to him as he translates it into English. Uh, Tiras lean basic. Let's go with that. And yeah, I really appreciated that. Um, and yeah, he's always trying to learn and understand the world around him. So I, yeah, I I really super appreciate how much. Just, yeah, you know, um, at first he comes off as, as maybe maybe somewhat introverted or something. And because the others, like, listen to him and, and appreciate all this knowledge he has, you know, he doesn't continue to be really, you know, now obviously in real life it's not quite that simple. But, yeah, you know, a lot of introverts, if, if you listen to them if you engage with you know yeah they are yeah who am i kidding i i can be fairly introverted myself so yeah you know if you if you engage with us yeah uh you know i'm not saying all of us are you know good people i've known some introverts that were really not good people but or like i said earlier yeah they chose was that this video or was that the thoughts video? I forget. Um, but yeah, I don't believe that anyone is good or evil by like birth or something. Uh, we human beings are capable of choosing good or choosing evil. Um, you know, animals are just neutral. They're just fighting for survival. But yeah, um, I've known some introverts that chose evil. Um, but a number of us choose good. And it really is just, you just got to get... Just, just slightly below the the surface and engage with us and yeah we you know you can have a conversation with us same as extroverts not all of us but some um and amar chada patel plays borman a thief and swordsman who is offered freedom from prison if he joins the quest now it is perhaps not great that the you know he's he's perhaps the the most obvious not white person in the but i mean tony revolori is also um and he's a prince and his father the king is also from from the um i'm 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 gonna try not to be specific because i always get it wrong but um yeah um you know not not white um and amar jato patel he, like, his cleaver is seriously badass. Like, it is such a cool weapon. And he exudes rogue energy. He is possibly the single most 
fun main or major character in this entire show. Like, he is just so great. Uh, honestly, if they made, like, a spin-off that was just Borman, not any of the other major characters from this, just Borman and him in his sort of own world, because he, he like, talks about adventures, and it's like, wow, I would love to see that, you know. Just, yeah, it, um, a lot of people are going to have him as their favorite character. So, um, yeah, I don't know, you know, maybe you can buy the, the cleaver as a toy. Otherwise, if you're a parent, get ready to, like, get get your paper mache on. And just, because it's such a cool weapon. And he's just so much fun. Just, yeah. And it is this thing of, you know, he is he is different. He does not really follow the rules. Um, but he's not evil. He's not a bad person. He just, you know, sometimes there are things that he really wants to do that ultimately he probably shouldn't do. So, yeah, he ended up in prison. And, yeah, great character. And dempsey brick plays prince eric kit's twin brother who is kidnapped now kit and eric as the offspring of mad mardigan they look and behave like it you know i already mentioned that she can be very harsh you know um yeah both of them want adventure and struggle to settle down and they're not the most diplomatic when they're talking to other people like they can sometimes be very brash you know and yeah um, also, he tosses his sword, much like uh, Mad Mardigan, and, yeah, they really, like, if you, if you look at what he looks like, it, it really is very much, you can, you can really tell that he is, the, you know, supposed to be. In, in real life, I don't know that he has any, um, genetic, uh, re relation to, um, yeah. The actor um, Val Kilmer. Uh, we are still in a time when empathy for women is something that is being fought for and against by progressives and conservatives, respect respectively, not respectfully. Conservatives are not very respectful. This show features young women fighting for the right to make choices about their future, which is extremely re re extremely relevant, as reproductive rights were and still are under attack. Now, I think they filmed this before Roe v. Wade got overturned, that, you know, that just means it's gotten even more relevant and important. And to, you know, if you're, if you're conservative and you're like, ah, I don't want to see all this, you know, female empowerment in, in movies and shows, go fight for Roe v. Wade. Um, and, and, you know, in general, like, I, 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 I find it, baffling when when you look at like during throughout the 80s there were so many such hateful depictions of women you know sometimes they were literally they would they would cast a woman and she was basically just there to look attractive and or something really gross done to her like uh, uh you know slasher movies are just full of young women being killed in brutal ways like, I feel like we men have had the chance to, to, you know, make media that's empathetic towards women. If if we can't do better than we have so far, I welcome more women in, in you know, well, I would either way, but especially. Um, and we, you know... If you remember the movie, you might remember that Willow had a daughter called Mims. And she's actually played by the actual daughter of Warwick Davis. And she gives a great performance. Uh, no one in this feels like a diversity hire. It's clear they have talent and deserve to be here. No one was hired just to fill a quota or something. Um, let's see, and there's a real grit to everything, like in the film, the evil beings are scary, they lie, try to divide people, and, you know, again, like a number of conservatives, and, yeah, uh, not exhausting member berries, it feels organic, um, yeah, I care about every major character in this, there's no one that I just wish, like, 
I know not everybody agrees with me on this, but I think the movie would be better if you just straight up removed the two brownies. They're just so unbearable. I, I don't understand... Um, I don't understand being having your age in, in double digits and not finding them incredibly frustrating. But, you know, to each their own. Let's see. Um... Right, and, and yeah, so uh, some critic quotes. Um, the characters don't bond and act too stereotypical. There's definitely some stereotypical, yeah. I, I thought the bonding worked. Uh, tries too hard to recreate the behavior they had in the film. Why is Willow still impatient several decades later? I gotta say, that is, yeah, um... You know, he's still fun to watch. Warwick Davis can still act. And, and it is, you know... Uh, it, I, um, I don't mean to engage in, in ageism here, but, you know, some... Like, eventually you do lose it, of course. Uh, the ability to act. You know, if you age enough, you lose everything. Um, but the... the Yeah. He's... he's it, it really doesn't make that much sense. Uh, especially because, like, he's much more respected by... His um, Nelwyn kind now, you know. I, I could understand in in the in the movie, you know. Part of it is like, you know, like his his family love him, but not very many people. I, I guess his family respect his decisions when they aren't terrible, but the the village doesn't. Uh, they don't think very highly of him at all, and now they do. So why, you know, you yeah, you, you feel like I mean. He should basically be like Gandalf or something, you know, he should be this old, wise, patient guy, and instead he's still, yeah, you know, he's, he kind of has the energy of like a 20-year-old or something, and it's, yeah, it's just kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, some people have said it's like CW Willow or Disneyfied Willow, characters that talk and act like modern people despite existing in this fantasy period i that's 100 percent true and that is that has bothered a lot of people probably will bother a lot of potential viewers i personally think it really does work for the show it's totally appropriate for the rest of it i definitely acknowledge it's probably because the, they're worried that they might turn off more casual viewers and the movie isn't really like the movie's all in like um there's not really any time in the movie where they are like, ah, okay, for the for the people who don't really want to do a fantasy thing, let's have something. It's like, you know, everything fits in the fantasy world, and this one is somewhat different, and yeah. You know, it, uh, Princess Bride is... is th this is Willow by way of the Princess Bride, and I think that works, and... and you know, ultimately, um, I, I don't, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think that one was substantially more of a of a success. You know, including with young viewers than the the Willow movie, and probably also than this show has been so far. Um, yeah, some people, you know, are frustrated that Kit doesn't check her privilege. You know, Mad Mardigan wasn't royalty. So him behaving like that was less... Um, yeah, you know, but... Yeah, like I said... Um, she she is never... She never expects people to treat her better because she is the princess. Uh, over the course of the episodes, the members of the Fellowship get character development back... Sorry. Character development, comma, backstories, I gotta get better at punctuation in my notes. Backstories, there are twists and turns, and that's very true. Uh, yeah, I think I, I don't really want to quote the anti-LGBT reviewers that... Right, uh, one, one real quick, um, let's see... Just to, just briefly, yeah, yeah, um, 
Okay, so this person, this is a user review. This is not a professional review. And it shows. Like, I, I, I love when people are like, oh, we should, you know, user reviews should be taken with, taken just as seriously as, uh, as professional reviews. And then they go on to prove why that is very much not the case. So, case in point, truly unfortunate that Disney feels such a strong need to show shoehorn woke ideology. If you... Not a fan of the word woke. I will direct you to the fandom initiative for t t talking about... I, let's see, that is what they're called, right? Fandom initiative... I just, yeah, the fandom initiative um, where the... Um, yeah, you know, they, they fairly recently talked about this just how how uh, for a lot of people work woke, woke just you know oh whatever you know doesn't doesn't they can't really define it or debate it so anyway shoehorn woke ideology and lgb relationships in every show according to u.s census data we are talking about less than four percent of our population yet they continue to demand that we see it in every show as a central focus yeah because they're currently the target of many hate crimes and legislation trying to ruin their lives you know, if, if you hate seeing progressive politics in movies and shows, take it up with all the people who are making it necessary by their hateful, violent, sometimes murderous actions. You know, fairly recently, the, um, um, there, there were a number of anti-trans laws. So, you know, what, like, can you really not stand to see it in your media when, when it's, like... There are things I don't want to see in, in shows. I generally think that uh, stuff relating to, to toilets should basically, like, sure, if there's some kind of, if you're exploring something or if, if it's about someone who has some problem in that way, but by and large, I don't think that we need to see people on the toilet in, in stuff, you know. That's because, like you know, like I said, if it's if it's to raise awareness, sure, go for it. But otherwise, no, because it's not necessary. You know, I realize that. Okay, so yeah, that was not the best choice of. Um. I don't think the uh, crap. Yeah, I don't actually have. See, all of my examples. There's there's stuff I want to see in fiction because it helps raise awareness and lead to acceptance then there's stuff i don't want to see because i think it has the opposite effect i'm not sure there's really anything that i don't want to see just because i think it's pointless and it's yeah uh anyway if there weren't laws against it then I don't think that if if there if there wasn't such a such a fight, then I don't think you would see as much media that's trying to spread awareness and acceptance of it. But there is that much hatred, you know. In I I have a huge amount of empathy for any trans individual or relative of a trans person in America who's suffering under these just beyond disgusting laws just and and that's the thing like i could i would have so much more respect for these conservatives reviewing stuff like this if they would at least acknowledge like if they just if they started by saying i hate what's happening to trans people all around america right now because of transphobia but i don't think this show handles the trans aspect well you know, but no, instead we just get these people who say, you know, they're not even, they're not even a very large part of the, yeah. And then he goes on to say, truly too bad, had high hopes for a fun return to the amazing fantasy university of Willow, but quickly realized the show only exists to continue to try to normalize LGB relationships. And, okay, so first of all, that is 100% not the only reason for it. Like, you're talking about two characters out of the let, let's see the so the fellowship is kit 
Dove, Jade, Willow, Graydon, and Borman. Out of six characters, two of them are in, in a... You know, and, and it's not, like, constantly about... Like, I agree that certainly it's a big aspect of the show, but it's not just this non-stop... Like, as... Yeah. If you... If you want something that is only about a specific group of people, yeah, you know, 300 is only about only four white men. If you're not a white man, 300 thinks you're disgusting. But this show, like, if you're not, you know, okay, okay, so there are, of, of, the, of the six, let's see, th yeah, three of them are male. One of those males is also white. Yeah, he's also a dwarf, which bothers some people, apparently. Anyway, um, Eric is white and a good man. You know, it's not... It doesn't... It's not against white men. It's just trying to, you know, sp yeah, encourage acceptance of people who aren't white men. Right, and so this person, holy crap, I think someone needs to check in on this person. I don't think they're okay. Um, they wrote, yet another Western story being destroyed by the woke psychos. I really don't think that calling us psychos makes that much sense, considering that the other side is literally killing people and protecting the killers. Uh, then they go on to say scary amounts of perversion and degeneracy for what should be a light-hearted adventure for children. Demons are real. I, I, I'm not even joking. I think this person might need some kind of, like, therapy or something. Just that's not, that's not a healthy response to anything in this show. And I do think it is interesting that this person thinks that acknowledging that lesbians exist and are human beings is demonic. Like, clearly, this person is religious, so I would just like to see them more angry at the pedophile-protecting Catholic Church than pro-LGBTQ content. Uh, yeah, some people said, you know, why are all the people on the quest unlikely heroes? I will grant that I... I think they do say, I'm not, I forget why it is that they don't send, like, the Tiraslene army now that they can. You know, in, in the movie, like, for most of the movie, they can't because the, the, uh, let's see. I th uh, let's see. I think at first there's some off-screen battles that they're partaking in, and then later they, you know, they, they only have the word of this Nelwyn, and they don't think highly of Nelwyn. Um, and then the, um, ah, uh, hold on, I just gotta make sure that is something I can deal with later. Um, yeah, you know, the, they don't like Nelwyn, and the other person's word is Mad Mardigan, and they don't trust him. But by the end of the movie, once they realize that these are two trustworthy people, the army does help. And here, like, I don't... I'm, I'm not going to talk about whether there is an army in this at all, but, like, they, when they leave for the quest, they don't bring the army. They bring, like, a, a tiny little bit of, you know, there's, there's a... I feel like there's one military guy, maybe, but, you know... Um, I agree that it's it it could have been a bit more like natural and smooth smoothly integrated, but the movie is also about unlikely heroes. Now uh, let's see the right and yeah, um, this one critic said. Oh, right. Uh, uh, one critic said, bad costumes. I don't really agree, but I want to acknowledge that some people feel that way. And, you know, I, I, uh, I've been discussing this show with a friend of mine who loves the movie. Uh, um, one of, like, Man Mardigan is one of his favorite childhood heroes, you know. 
And he didn't think there was anything wrong with the costumes. He doesn't think everything is great about the show, but he didn't see anything wrong with costumes. Anyway, um, yeah, there's one person said, So much media today has inclusion, even when it doesn't make sense, like in a fantasy setting. Okay, if we're going to talk about media that goes out of its way to focus on a specific group of people... Let's keep in mind that the first Avatar movie bends over backwards to make sure that the lead is a white man because there is this expectation that white guys don't want to watch movies that aren't about white guys and everybody else can just suck it, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it would be so much more natural for that movie to star an actual native person, both character and casting, hopefully, who becomes aware of the corp the the uh, let's see. yeah the the corporation and the the corporation and the military that want the the mineral you know let's let's I'm gonna there we go okay so I am very very quickly gonna gonna just speed run okay so the things that need to happen in order for the first and I'm not going to be spoiling the movie, don't worry. But, yeah, okay, so, first off, um, well, he's working for, you know, that it's, it's the corporation sending in people, and, I mean, what about the other, you know, the, there are several people who aren't white guys, so, anyway. Um, it's his twin brother who was supposed to go and he's the one who knew all the stuff, but they already genetically, you know, designed this avatar body. So, no, it has to be this ignorant white guy who has nothing other than military training. You know, so, so he can spend the movie learning about the culture. And so we can deal with our white guilt, you know, through this just, yeah... Way too much media is just there for straight white cis man catharsis. It's ridiculous. Um, oh, right. Why would he... Why would he go along with the Avatar? Oh, well, uh, he... Uh, he's paraplegic. And he's he's going to get his legs back if... You know, both during the, the Avatar thing and after. So, you know, because... let's Let's just turn, you know physically physical disability into a storytelling tool who cares about empathy for them uh let's see then you have the the yeah and and then you know then he gets lost because they're not paying attention and they can't find him even though they spent an insane amount of resources building this body and they can plug your brain into the body from way off, but they can't find? It just, it makes no sense. It, James Cameron is bending over backwards to death. And I usually love James Cameron, and I do still... There's still a lot to love about the first Avatar, but boy, is it problematic. And it's just, like... Yeah, it... That's an example of people bending over backwards to make sure that, like, why why shouldn't a fantasy setting have non-whites and lesbians? And, so, like, why is that completely impossible? Like, I could understand if you're talking about, like, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, like a story told about reality that's, like, really, really long ago you know, why is there so much diversity? There wasn't diversity in that part of the world at that time. Okay, but fantasy, like, fantasy has changed for as long as fantasy stories have been told. You know, why is it suddenly a problem now to change it again? Like, yeah. Um, and, and Cavernacle has done excellent videos on, you know, talking about the... the you know, yeah, arguing against this idea that stuff like Lord of the Rings can only have white men. Uh, I think I might put the links, unless I forget, there will be links in the description box. Cavernacle, Lord of the Rings, there we go. Um, 
let's see. Yeah, uh, if you're a really big fan of the brownies in the movie, you should know you'll probably feel like there's too little of them in this show. Now, the film presents a sad, albeit realistic-ish world where, you know, if you aren't a dwarf, you're almost definitely anti-dwarf. And it also has the gross message that if you're ugly, you're evil. The show tries to be more optimistic, saying that using slurs is a sign of evil, if not inherent, then temporary, and communicating that it's wrong to judge people based on their appearance. You know, I, I feel like if the movie... If Willow wasn't fantasy, if it was, like, if it was supposed to be set in, like, America, I think the Nelwyn would have been, like, black or something, you know, because, like, everywhere they go, people are using... I, I'm not gonna repeat it. Um, but, yeah, they have that slur against them that really makes me wonder if it's supposed to be, like, the N-word or something. And, you know, yeah, um... This show does not use that word very much, and when someone uses it, it tends to be to indicate, oh, they're maybe, like, possessed or some, you know, or, or a sign that they are possessed. It's not necessarily... Yeah, yeah, it might indicate to a character, oh, no, they're, they must be possessed, because, you know, it's, it's basically... Yeah, and, and I get it. I, you know, in 1988, there was definitely... I realized it was seen as that's how we improve things. We have to show that a group is really, really hated um, and then show them do, you know, do good. That will tell young people you shouldn't hate someone because of, you know, some, some, yeah, like something like height, you know, or ethnicity or such. Um, I think today it just makes more sense to make fiction that shows only the the bad done when it's clearly oh okay well this you know this is an environment where these kinds of, of things happen more than just oh everyone in the world is this way you know everyone thinks less of the the Nelwyn or dwarves in the movie and just that means that you ultimately don't really have an example of something, you know, um, when you have movies and shows that have a world where there is less, um, I guess I'll go with uh, xenophobia, then, you know, that shows people, I mean, maybe it's possible, you know, maybe we could actually, yeah. Um, some of the teenagers on the show struggle to focus but are not made out to be lost causes because of it, so very progressive. And the women on the show are not waiting around for some guy to define them or to settle down with. They have aspirations of their own. Um, so the the dialogue... You know, there's there's a ton of wit on this show. And, like, the different characters do speak differently, you know, even though there is a lot of this modern, you know, teen talk kind of thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, so so some people say, you know, oh, the accents are inconsistent, going back and forth between American and British, but someone else pointed out, you know, the yeah, uh, I'm going to do a direct quote. What also isn't a problem is the use of American accents, which seem to be vexing others. The original movie had American accents aplenty. Val Kilmer, Billy Barty, David Steinberg all had American accents, as did Joanne Whaley and Gavin O'Harrelly, both don American accents in the film, albeit hailing from Salford, Manchester, and Dub Dublin, Ireland, respectively. So accent is rather a mute point. Um, let's see... Yeah, I, I gotta say, it really didn't bother me personally, uh, and I usually notice stuff like that and, and find it annoying. Oops. So, cinematography um, was handled by Joel Devlin, James Friend. Oh, boy. Uh, I'm gonna try. Stijan van der Wecken and Will Baldy. Um, 
yeah, the cinematography is gorgeous. Like, the, I, I already talked about the use of light, uh, uh, the use of color. The use of light is also very striking. Um, the, the, um, the movement of camera, just, there's, there's some really, really incredible, um, yeah. Now, uh, let's see. And, yeah, so the, the editing was handled by Mika Leskinen, Adam Green, Stephen O'Connell, and Tara Timpone. And... The editing keeps things moving, you know, I, I, obviously this is, this, this moves at a different pace than the movie, um, you know, in part because, you know, it's made 34 years after the movie came out, a lot of things have changed, um, and, you know, eight episodes, it's, uh, you know, if, if this were to be released as movies, it would be like three movies. I don't think it quite would be four, but yeah. Um, but yeah, um, it keeps things moving. Because it does the ensemble cast thing, it will sometimes cut between groups of, of people. You know, the, the fellowship are not always together as one unit sometimes they get split up for various reasons and it will cut between the different uh, chunks of the the fellowship and i could understand if some people feel that it takes away from the the you know epicness of it i think just yeah you know if, if you like princess bride you're gonna like you're more likely to like this than if not so the um let's see um right yeah yeah here we go uh so the the special effects so movies and tv shows of late look really hollow bland and devoid of life because they are literally taking place in green screen latin voids which are then being populated by underpaid and overworked vfx and cgi artists since everyone isn't james cameron and cannot give their workers the time they need to make their virtual sets look realistic these projects are failing to connect on a fundamental level so it's best to hack to uh, so the best hack to work around this problem is to go back to the roots literally rely on sets and physical locations and use vfx only when necessary and that's exactly what kazdan and his team have done and you can see the actors in the dirt muck moss and windy environments wax eloquent about honor and magic as for the action scenes there's a lot happening in there and the work that has gone into them is appreciable uh, yeah, some people feel that they're badly framed and edited. I, yeah, I just, I don't agree. It, it you know, obvious, I, I'm not going to say that it's not, it's, it's, this is not on the level of something like the Lord of the Rings. Um, but it is still really, really strong. There's some excellent stunt work, some through, in, in fights and such. And yeah, some of this was shot in shot in stu yeah studio, uh, but it was also shot uh, in Wales on location. Let's see. Um, yeah, uh, some people feel that the sets feel like sets don't feel connected with the establishing shots the overall aesthetic is too clean the world of the movie felt old and lived in not like it was built and painted the day before and the characters felt real so i agree about the the movie but i i don't think that this show fails to to do what the movie did there uh there's some very impressive vistas like in the film very deeply memorable and you can easily tell them apart from even a quick glimpse a very strong sense of location to each and the action is you know not all of it is amazing but th there was this one part that there's this action scene that involves horse riding and i found it hard to follow but that was really the only action scene that was true of and 
you know, it wouldn't be Willow without an action scene that's part chase and part fight during chase, but there is a really great scene like that later in the show. Uh, let's see. Yeah, some really cool weapons and magic, like, um, yeah, the, the, um, uh, let's see, did I not have anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Chase on foot and by horse, physical fights, ranged attacks, including while in vehicles, and use of the magic. Yeah, uh, really, really solid, just, yeah, uh, and, and you get a sense of, like, the magic, um, in, in the movie, the, the, um, you know, they, they use the effects that, that work for them to, to do the, the magic, and some of it is amazing, I love the Eborsisk, I'm not, uh, uh, right, if you haven't read that, then you don't know what that means, that is the two-headed fire-spewing dragon that Willow accidentally makes by using magic he can't control, on a troll. Uh, yeah, that one is is really, really, like, I'll acknowledge it doesn't, maybe it doesn't completely hold up, you know, whatever. It looks really good. I, I love practical effects. Um, yeah. This show, uh, often, like, if, if something is good magic, it will have, like, a light green glow or a teal glow or that kind of thing and evil magic will have a more sinister look um but but yeah you know not not all of the magic in the show is as elaborate as the magic in the movie some of it is though so the music and score uh so yeah this was scored by Alexander Ex Xander Rodzinski and James Newton Howard, I forgot about that. Holy crap, okay. Uh, yeah, um, Xander scored five episodes. Uh, James Newton Howard scored three. Um, it's really difficult to follow up. Uh, I almost called him Robin. John Williams. It's really, really, that is not... I, I, you know, I empathize with anyone who has to try to, to follow up a, a John Williams score. Um, I think they do pretty well. Um, some people really hate that this, you know, every so often it will use a piece of, like, modern music. Uh, some Sometimes even, like, pop music. I thought it worked. Uh, I, I really felt like... Each time, again, it's the, the Princess Bride, you know, tone thing, you know. If, yeah, if, if one were to try to describe, like, basically, watching this, it's a bit like having a um, child or a teenager retell you a story that they've been told. And when they, you know, when they were told it, they, all of the, the details were there. And they're now retelling it, and they're, you know, occasionally they'll throw in a, a like, or they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll use a bit of modern slang, you know, or, yeah, characters might talk more the way people talk today, you know, it's, it's that kind of, of vibe. Uh, the villains and antagonists, you know, like the movie itself, the show has amazing, if not exactly original villains, very memorable. Um, let's see, you know, yeah, like, like I said, Bev Morda, not the most original either. Uh, same for um, uh, Sorsha and um, Kale, you know. Uh, let's see. And I guess that... Yeah, so the, the pacing is definitely not... Not completely even, but I do think this, it gets really, I'm really glad this is eight episodes. I love the MCU, uh, especially Phase 4. I really, really love what they've been doing. Um, I really hope that now that we're past Phase 4, getting into Phase 5, I really hope they're going to start giving MCU Disney Plus shows more than six episodes because it is never enough. It is just like the only the the ones that 
have more than that, use that. You know, so so we're talking, hold on, I have them right here. Uh, right, so here and then uh, this is not it. This is not it. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Oh, right, right, this is the... Here we go. So, yeah, um, WandaVision, What If, and She-Hulk. And yes, I realized some people disagree with me on that, especially She-Hulk. But yeah, those actually use the extra time they have. Whereas Falcon the Winter Soldier, Loki, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, and Ms. Marvel, all of them only have six episodes each. And each time... There's, you, you could feel like, you know, I, I re, I've been, yeah, I've watched all of them twice now, each. Boy, can you tell, like, the first time I maybe didn't notice as much, but watching the episodes closer together and knowing what it all leads to, like, there's really, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad this was eight episodes. I hope they start doing that. I hope that becomes the norm for MCU shows. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, pacing, like, some episodes are perhaps slower, and, and some just, yeah. This is also a, a show where some of the episodes are very distinctly, like, okay, let's take an episode and let's just do this with it, you know? And I loved it, but I can understand if some people might feel like, okay, uh, well, once you're... Pass that one, let's hope the next one doesn't do that kind of thing, but yeah. Um, I th suppose I could just very briefly the... Um, uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, um, so yeah, eight episodes, and they are between 40-some and 50-some minutes each. Uh, I would definitely say that each individual episode feels like it's... It has the, the length that makes sense for it. Um, let's see. So, yeah, uh, I would definitely say the best element of this is the diversity, the progressive messages being communicated, and how well they are communicated. Like, occasionally, a character will just stop and say the moral, you know. But a lot of the time, it's in who is doing what and what exactly is being accomplished by what is being done and these kinds of things you know that's always the the smooth and more more comfortable but of course you know there's a lot of you know patri yeah pro patriarchy messages that are also just stated you know in in other fiction non progressive fiction um Okay, so I really uh, try to uh, apply myself to think of, you know, I try to always do, okay, what's the best element, what's the worst element? Um, I guess, you know, personally, I think they're all delivered well, but I can't deny that this show doesn't have a single truly original joke. Like, all of them are jokes that, you know, th th different, different material, but the type of joke is a joke you've seen before. Um, but, but yeah, I don't think that's a big deal at all. Uh, so yeah, worst aspect, according to others, is the CW Willow, Willow Disney-fied Willow thing. Um, I totally understand why that bothers some people. Personally, I don't think it's a big deal, but I will definitely acknowledge the show is completely married to that um, approach. So if you don't like it early on, the show is not going to change. Uh, the show is going to keep doing... The th you know, that's that's the thing with streaming... Um, you know, they filmed it all before. They, they can't really adjust episodes very much the way that they could with network television. You know, if, if network television, if an episode didn't do particularly well, they'd be like, okay, what do we need to fix? Where here, it's like, I mean, they did it all already. It's all filmed. Uh, I think maybe, like, there's a joke. There's a joke in She-Hulk that really seems to be just really trolling the the misogynists who really hate that show 
I can't help but wonder if that was edited fairly late, like after the... F it's, it's very late in the show. It's one of the last episodes. I can't help but wonder if they edited that joke after seeing how a lot of the other episodes were really negatively received. Although it is also a show that mocks misogynists mercifully from the very... Like, literally frame one. Like, one of the first things is a misogynist being put in his place. Uh, I really wish we would get a second season of that, but anyway. Um... So the thing I was most worried about was, yeah, I was worried that it would lack the grit and wit of the film, and yeah, uh, the movie exceeded my expect uh, show exceeded my expectations. Uh, I was more, I was most looking forward to seeing more of Willow's world, and one hundred percent, it exceeded my expectations. Um, I think if you haven't watched very much of this, you might be like, ah, what's what's the big deal? Over the course of this show, they go to some really well-defined, really compelling places. You really get a sense of the world and how, like, yeah, what it's like to live in this overall realm. You know, trying to carve out your own part of, yeah, um, I, I think they did a really great job. Obviously, they can do more than the movie could, and I do think the movie did, uh a lot of good there as well. Um, there's there's some really interesting places in the the movie, but yeah, um, I th I think they did an incredible job there. So yeah, um, the I already mentioned that the pilot and finale are great. The overall season is also really really great. The trailer does give too much away. Like there's a thing. Uh... Okay, so brief spoilers. There's a thing in the trailer that doesn't happen until, I think it was the second to last episode. And it's like, I, I get why you want to show it off, because it looks amazing. But you really shouldn't give something like something that major away, I, I would say. Especially considering you can actually tell who is taking part in it. It's, you know, in the trailer, so you're like, oh, I guess that guy doesn't die until that happens. No more spoilers. So, yeah, uh, the trailer does give too much away, but it does also give you a really strong sense of what the show is like. So if you like the the trailer, you're much more likely to also like the show than if you do not like it. Um, the cover and poster don't give too much away, um, do give you some idea of what it's like, although they kind of play up the, the epic fantasy feel more than the, the show actually, yeah. Uh, let's see, I, oh, here we go, yeah, um, yeah, so this has, a... oh, hold on, that's, there we go, there it is, Rotten Tomatoes is different for the, um, the, the yeah, so, it has an 85% on the tomato meter, which makes it certified fresh, and the consensus is expanding on the saga while leaving plenty of room for callbacks to the original. This series-length sequel should satisfy fans who have been patiently waiting for more Willow. Yeah. And of the... Oh, can I, oh, here it is. Yeah. Of the 62 ratings, 53 of them are fresh. The audience score is 50% based on 3,500 ratings. The average rating is 2.9, and any rating below 3.5 out of 5 uh, on, on Rotten Tomatoes by, by a um, user is, is, a, is a down vote. You know, so yeah, half of people gave it less than 3.5. Uh, right, and the average critic rating is 7.00 out of 10. Um, I don't know if it's just, like, review bombing. Like, I, I feel like, you know you're just making yourselves look bad if you review bomb, right? And, and it just means that people can't tell if something is good or not. Like, I, I it really doesn't accom- it, it doesn't do anything good. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a brat child spitting out the food and demanding to, to have something they like better. It's, it's, there's nothing- just, yeah, you look ridiculous when you do it. Um, but yeah, for all I know, a bunch of people legitimately didn't like it. Uh, I feel like review bombing 
you're basically admitting that you didn't give it a chance. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, on, on Metacritic, it has a 70 out of 100 from Critics. And a... Let's see. Right, right. Um, based on 22 reviews, 15 positive, 6 mixed, 1 negative. Huh. Um... Okay, to each their own. Uh, and the user ratings, 2.1 out of 10. 147 ratings, um, 21 positive, 4 mixed, 122 negative, really. So if you don't know, um, anything below a 4 is negative. So if you think that this deserved... A 0 out of 10, 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, or 3 out of 10. Yeah. I'm just... I, f I find it hard to believe that very many of those are not just review bombers. Um, yeah, and some people don't even really say... Like, there's this... Yeah, this, this person has 20, 27 of 31 users upvoted this. And they wrote nothing about it. Right, right. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, characters are flat, uninteresting stereotypes. The plot is uninspired, generic. It doesn't capture the magic of the original. But other than that, he just writes a bunch of stuff about, like, oh, you know, um, fantasy and entertainment is bad now. So he criticizes Rings of Power, everything Star Wars since 1983, which um, he blames Amazon and Disney for this. I don't think he has the, the timeline right. If he thinks Star Wars has been bad since 1983, then there's three movies that George Lucas made without Disney that he apparently... Yeah. And I, I, I'm not a fan of the prequel movies, but I'm just saying that you're... you're he should maybe have, have checked the dates there. Uh, let's see. What is... Okay, so, yeah, seven and above is positive. I could understand a lot of mixed, but so many negative. That just doesn't make any sense to me, other than review bombing. Uh, okay, so I've been trying to... Yeah, okay, let's see what the... Yeah, so on IMDb, it has a 5.3 out of 10, with 22.1% giving it a 1 out of 10. I feel like they need to make, like, instead of letting people who want to review bomb something ruin the rating for everybody else. Because, like, I, you know, even if I didn't like it, I would, nobody can use this. This is, this is useless for everyone who doesn't just want to hate it without knowing anything about it. Anyway, yeah, I feel like instead of them voting normally, like, there should just be a I want a review bomb thing so you could just see a percentage of, like, you know, this amount of people wanted to review bomb it. Okay, well, I don't want re I don't want to see what review bombers, you know, I want to see what actual people voted. But, you know, how do you make sure that it's not review bombers? Yeah. You know, like, originally Rotten Tomatoes did allow people to vote. I, I, I think that was always a bad idea, and I used to... I'm, I'm glad it's gone. But you used to be able to vote. Like, basically, it was like, want to see it or just don't want to see it kind of thing. But it would add up as a, as a... It looked like it was people's opinions of the actual product before it was out. Like, people would, you know... Yeah. And eventually Rotten Tomatoes had to get rid of it because people were abusing it. Like, I think the I, I think they thought that people would, you know, it, it would be like, you know, oh, you know, 70% of people are really excited about this movie or, you know, or just, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know, that not that many people are interested in that movie. But instead, like, it started to, people used it as if, they were somehow rating the the final the finished movie long before anyone had a chance to see it so they had to remove it you know that's what you get by review bombing like i think eventually stuff like that might happen you know 
for some of these others, you know. So, yeah, anyway, um, IMDb, 18.6% uh, gave it 10. Uh, I'll, I'll get to my rating uh, shortly. 10.2% gave it 8, 9.5 gave it 7, 7.7 7 gave it 2, 6.9 gave it 5, 6.8 gave it 6, uh, 6.3 gave it 3, 6.2 gave it 9, 5.7 gave it 4. I can understand rating it around like a 5 or a 4. Like if you really don't think, you know, if, if you think that uh, it's not that, that the, you know, yeah, for the for the people who think that the action isn't good, who think that the the it looks like a C, you know it's like a CW show from the nineties, or or a network show from the nineties. Um, let's see, what were the other things that they didn't like? Um, yeah, they don't like the the dialogue, and some people apparently think the acting is bad, which I really can't. I I if if you know please. Go to the comments, let me know, what did you think, can, can you point to a line that you really think was badly delivered? And I'll watch it again, and I'll see if I see it, but I just don't, right now I really don't see it. Um, right, I didn't say that in, in this video. I know I can be kind of harsh in these videos. In comment sections, I try to be very diplomatic, even with people I really d disagree with. If you're not preaching hatred, you are welcome in my comment section, and I will try, you know, if you... If you write stuff you didn't like about the show, you know, I'm willing to debate it. Um, but, but yeah, you know, five or a four, if you, if you thought all those things were bad. Um, I can understand people who, I, I feel like a ten is, it's, I, I personally find that to be, to be high. Um, but, but yeah, um, let's see... But, but yeah, giving it a 1, like a 1 basically means that you think everything was bad or that the bad was so bad that it ruined everything else. Just, there are actually bad movies and shows right now um, and people can't tell which ones they are because ones that are, you know, either good or just okay but not the best thing ever are getting review bombed. Now, let's see... So, yeah. see, yeah, when I look at the Zack Snyder Justice League IMDb, you know, that's also a very recent, it came out, uh, 2021, um, Okay, there's, yeah, some, some people did vote it very, very low, but a huge chunk of people gave it very high. I've seen a lot of individual YouTubers who raised excellent points, and I myself don't think, I don't think it's particularly good. Um, yeah. But then you have these toxic fans who harass people online if they don't get their way, you know, drive Kelly Marie Tran off Twitter, give death threats to David Boyega. Crap, is that, wait, ah, crap, I think I bungled his name. I'll, I'll find it real quick. So he appears in The Force Awakens, and his name is John Boyega. Sorry, I think I was to, I must have, uh, I think I was thinking of the um, John David Washington. That's why I mixed up John and David. Um, you know, people sent him death threats. Like, it's insane. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the Snyder Cut is... Not, like, the Snyder Cut proved... This, they, you know, yeah, they got their way, but it's not a good movie. What he was, you know, maybe would have been if it wasn't the assembly cut with finished special effects. You know, if, if he had gotten to, and, and for sure, like, I, I have empathy for Zack Snyder, even if he doesn't seem to have empathy for very many people. Um, I don't think anyone should have to live through one of their children committing suicide. You know, I, I really empathize with him for that. Um, but, so, so, you know, I, you know, I, 
I feel like the studio used, you know, he, he was like, I need to take a little time. And they basically used that as an excuse to make the, the original theatrical cut of Justice League so different from what Zack wanted. Um, when really, like, I mean, just have some balls. Fire the guy. You know, he wasn't making money for you. That was your problem. So, anyway, I, I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of, Yeah, there was probably, like, some kind of uh, contract thing preventing that. Anyway, um, yeah. You know, I the, the fact that the final... That, that the Snyder Cut is a bad movie does tell... Or, or at best, average... Um, does show that the toxic fans were wrong, but unfortunately, because there are so many of them, you know, 147,984 people gave the Snyder Cut a 10 out of 10, which just, like, even if I loved it, even if I thought it was really well done, I don't, I can't see giving it higher than an 8. Like, there are such big problems. Uh, you know, I, I made a four-hour video talking about the problems in that movie. Um, but, but, yeah. Unfortunately, right now, the misogynists, the, the hateful people online, are really good at the, the getting people to downvote movies that are progressive and, and shows, regardless of quality, and upvoting stuff that is regressive, regardless of quality. Like, if, if you watch it, if you just, if you remove all context and just sit down and watch it, it's agonizingly slow and boring and just yeah um and and so many things like basically the you know visually some of it is better for sure but that's basically the only thing and and so much of the movie is the same as we got in theaters just you know there's a couple of lines that Josh Whedon added that made it way better that are now gone and you're just left with this grim dark boring like anyway um back to willow so uh yeah so there are now 23 links to external reviews um yeah i gotta admit i kind of dipped out of i haven't been looking very much at other people at, at ne ne negative criticism of this because it's just so toxic it's full of these hateful monsters fighting for the right to legally kill you know because that's just stop and actually think about it what is it that why do you hate pro lgbtq content so much it used to be you know like i guess technically it was illegal to kill but like if you go to a small town they probably killed someone or, or threatened to kill someone and the, you know, the police were like, well, they are gay, you know. Reagan certainly wanted as many gay Americans to die as at all possible, you know, dragging his feet on, you know, trying to save lives during the, the AIDS crisis. So that's what it, that, that it, if, if there is widespread, if, if, Lack of widespread acceptance of LGBTQ people leads to stuff like AIDS not being taken seriously. We're, we are, we're not just talking about, oh, you know, I don't like the color blue. I like the color red. No, we're talking about people's lives, livelihoods, and whether or not they have a happy life, even if they are allowed to live. You know, it's... Yeah. There are currently no extras on oh uh yeah the the trailer is the only supposed extra on disney plus for the show right now but the show is there and so is the movie so you know if you're a fan of willow makes sense to to get you know i'm really glad it's no longer this stupid thing of, of well you know i suppose yeah for those who don't only get their like i some you know i go to the movies and i use disney plus that's it. I don't watch TV. I don't, you know, none of all of these. I don't have any other streaming service, and I don't intend to, you know. It must really suck to have to have a ton of different streaming services and all the, you know. I'm a fan of Marvel. Most of Marvel's on Disney Plus now, so I don't have to go anywhere else. 
Now, um, yeah, overall, I rate this eight gritty fairy tale sequels out of ten. And I hope that in the future, uh, you know, people will look back and give this more of a chance who aren't currently. Um, honestly, I, I find it really... I think a lot of the people who just really don't like this just can't get past the, the you know, inclusive inclusion message for, for LGBTQ. Just, yeah. Um... But yeah, I, I think this is much, much better than the, the movie. Um, I didn't write down, but I can find real quick. What was it that... Oh, hold on. Uh, oh, that was the wrong one. Um, this is where it would be. So let's see if it be. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Here we go. So, the original 1988 movie, Willow... I gave, uh, oh, hold on, I guess, um, oh, right, I did give it a seven, um, okay, yeah, sometimes I, uh, even so, I, I would much rather, I, yeah, I just did, I just rewatched. You know, I've I've watched the first seven episodes twice, and the fi the finale I only watched once. Uh, you know, yeah, over the last week or so, I rewatched the movie and the first seven episodes, and like, yeah, I I the movie is not really my kind of thing. There's there's definitely some talent in there, but the the brownies, and there's way too much bickering in, in that for me. And I do also not think that that... I don't think that makes the world a better place. I think people are just going to imitate that and bicker. Um, but yeah, um, you know, if I'm going to watch something from from back then that has to do with George Lucas, it's going to be the first two Star Wars movies, you know. I think he did a much, much better job on, on those. Uh, you know, he, he wrote those and he wrote Willow, um, the movie. Anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, hit me up in the comment section. Let me know. Uh, let's see. What was your, what was your favorite, uh, um, place in, in, in this show? Uh, what's your favorite episode? Uh, who's your favorite character and... What of of the of the evil of the evil beings in this? Which one did you think was like the coolest and scariest and and gnarliest looking? Uh, yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since a movie's running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, so let's catch my way next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.